Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Square Circle Podcast. I am your host, Marie Shadows. And on this episode, we will only be covering AEW Dynamite that debuted on April 29th, 2020. This show, to me, as you guys know, I am a huge professional wrestling fan. I do not watch the business as a fan. I watch the business to break it down and tell you guys how the psychology works in the matches you know, what storyline should go with, and then just explain certain things. This whole entire show, from start to finish, had me... This whole entire show, from start to finish, had me frustrated. There were some pluses, but this is not going to be me bashing AEW for the first time to have all the negative people rejoice. No, this isn't it. I have my notes... I have my thoughts, I have my opinions, and this is how we should make AEW better. semifinals um the winner of this match will go to face the other person in the second bracket uh for the tnt uh championship uh tournament i've been saying for weeks on this podcast that cody doesn't really need the belt darby doesn't need the belt darby is way over than anyone else and Darby doesn't need the belt at this time. Darby just needs to keep going with the momentum that he has, keep making vignettes, keep, you know, people interested in, keep people saying, I want Darby with this, I want Darby with that. Like, Darby's name needs to be forever in the minds of the fans. Um, just don't slow down with him. As for giving him a title, it's a little too early. Um, he still needs to probably wrestle some more people, be in some more programs with other people. He works really well with Sammy Guevara. That's a really good, interesting uh, matchup there. You know, he could work with someone like Cole Cabana. Cole Cabana is very creative. He could work with Kenny Omega. Kenny Omega is super creative. Um, if Darby ever wanted to form a tag team, how interesting would it be if Sammy and Guevara had a tag team? Two opposites, like complete opposites, form a tag team just because they had a series of matches and they hated each other and it showed on Twitter. You know, there's more stuff for Darby to do rather than getting important belts. You know for sure that the TNT Championship is an important belt. You know for sure that the AEW World Heavyweight Championship is an important belt. And you definitely know that the Tag Team Championships are an important belt. But, like, does he need it at the moment? He has a lot of credibility under his belt. You know, I'm even a big fan of Darby. I watched him in the Indies way before he came to AEW. And he is a star. He is a star. I will not deny that. And I'm not saying that he can't, you know, win a championship belt, but for him to win it this early, not that very good because sometimes if a wrestler wins a belt super early, what do you do with them? The perfect example is Sheamus. They gave Sheamus the belt way too early. Didn't know what to do with him. Didn't have anything planned. And, you know, it went to shit. Here in AEW, you have to probably take precaution and steps of who you want to carry the belt and who you want to run with the ball. Because if you're going to allow the wrestlers to basically dictate their own storylines and their own careers, sometimes it's not for the best because you do need someone there to be like, that will work, but this wouldn't work because of X, Y, and Z. But let's see how we can improve the idea that that technically wouldn't work. You know, you always need a, a creative team, no matter what. Um, I do know that we're not fond of being constricted. 
on like promos or like how to wrestle. And I totally understand that. And I understand that, you know, WWE shouldn't have a hundred writers in a room trying to tell wrestlers what to do. There should at least be someone that says, yes, no, maybe we'll try that. And then, you know, be like, hey, maybe next week we, we could try your idea and see how it works and let's tweak it because we have, you know, four days off. Let's do vignettes. Let's see how the crowd works. Like, you really do need someone there to be like, that's just how my mind is working at the moment. Um, and this isn't to knock Darby at all. Darby is great at what he does. It's not to knock him. I was just going off and giving examples and stuff like that. Uh, when it comes to Cody, what I recently felt is that despite Cody Rhodes being a baby face and sometimes dream matches doing, if you haven't noticed, he's been booking himself strong. He's been booking himself strong. Now you might say, what do you mean he's been booking himself strong? He's been losing every single major match. That is true. That is 100% true. But if you really look at it, we're still talking about Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes is still getting the social media spots. Cody Rhodes is still doing all the work he can for charities and foundations. Um, no matter what match Cody Rhodes is in, even though he loses, who are we talking about? We may be talking about the winner for about maybe 15 minutes, but who are we still talking about? We're still talking about Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes is booking himself strong no matter what. Even when he loses, he's booking himself strong because we keep talking about him. And again, this is not a knock to Cody Rhodes. He's a legend. He's going to be a one-day um, Hall of Famer in whatever wrestling Hall of Fame that we're going to put him in. Um, and he, he's, he was born for this business. So I'm not knocking him um, for any of that. It's the fact of he's been going strong. And I'm just like, you got to slow it down. You got to pull it back a little bit because, you know, you also are EVP. It's like he still has the WWE mark, the WWE mark on him. The same thing with Dustin. I'll get to Dustin later on in this podcast episode. And I think now is the best time to break out of it. And, you know, for a while, uh, I thought that everything that AEW does when they're poking fun at WWE is totally fine because that creates a little bit of a competition in a way. You know, if AEW claims that they are the alternative and they're poking fun at WWE's stupidity, I think that's fine. I think that's, you know, fair game because WWE could come back and like, you know, take some shots at AEW. Like, who knows? Like, it creates a friendly competition. At the same time, you guys are both boosting up ratings and boosting up characters and see who could top who. You know, what WWE has instilled in all of us for years, which is sports entertainment that, you know, AEW has arrived on the scene. They're the new alternative. You know, there's a reason why people should watch AEW and AEW has that going for them. Like it's very transparent. It's very authentic. It's very authentic. And what you get, what you see is what you get. So Cody versus Darby. I'm going to go through my notes and then we're going to be talking about that ending. And we're also going to be talking about that bump that Brandy took. In the beginning of the match, both guys were evenly matched. Obviously, these guys have studied each other. This is their third confrontation, and they should know each other by now in terms of how to count on each other's moves, how to make each other look like a million bucks. He pushes Darby into the turnbuckles, and then as Ref Aubrey tells Cody Rhodes to uh, have a clean break, Darby goes under Cody Rhodes' arms to reverse it and does the same thing to, to Cody. Um, that little exchange was Darby goes under Cody Rose's arms to reverse it and does the same thing to, to Cody. That little exchange was very super and very smooth, really, really good. And as you saw in the tape, Darby maintained risk control. And for some reason, throughout all these weeks during quarantine, the main focus has been risk control. And that's a very...
the small attention to detail wrestling styles with wrist locks and focusing on the body part and stuff like that. That is what makes AEW the alternative. Not so much the flashy moves. It's the small attention to detail that I love seeing. And there's this one pin where at the count of two. However, his knee. Now, if you've been following Cody Rhodes for a good while, you know that he had knee surgery. So the first time that I met Cody Rhodes in person was at the big event that happens here in New York City. And during that time, he was getting ready and prepped while well, the doctors were going to be cleaning out his knee so that way it could feel a lot better when he uh, wrestles. So all the way till now in this match with Darby, all of a sudden it hurts when there's no prior mention to this happening. Like it just happened to be a thing in the match so that way Darby could focus on. Darby could have focused on anything else in uh, the match, like any other body part of Cody Rhodes. Uh, Cody Rhodes still needs his arms in order to get you into the crossroads. So he could have worked on, you know, Cody's shoulder, maybe the elbow, maybe, you know, the hands, because that's a little bit harder to kind of control once you lose your grip that's it it's like what else can you do you're gonna have to pull out a different type of move but Cody. work on the knee for a little bit but i just felt like that really wasn't needed like, work that on was the knee really for a little bit place. like why but would you want to like that really that wasn't needed. Needed. like no that story was really out about place. it place. like you why know, would you want to person in that in there the when there's no story built in the vignettes in the you promos know, the tapes in the vignettes in the promos ever mentioned about cody rhodes knee like no one asked cody rhodes uh you know hey you know, you're going into this match with Darby. Darby is relentless. Darby will use anything in his possession to pick up the victory. Are you uh, 100%? Like, does anything hurt? We know that you have, you know, prior surgeries and injuries. Like, is anything flaring up? And there's no word. Cody is calm and collective. Cody has this mindset of that he's going to beat Darby and praises Darby, like, you know, the baby face that he is. And I guess we could call... Darby the heel at this point, which I have don't think he is. I just think he's probably an anti-hero. But not even Darby said that, you know, Cody, I know your one weakness, it's your knee, because you've had a surgery. And then all of a sudden in this match to have Cody's knee play a factor as if like all of a sudden, like I, I didn't get that spot. Like, why would that spot be in there? It's a difference between when Matt from the Young Bucks talks about his back because he's been playing that up like forever and I still don't know if that's real or not but when Matt does it it's understandable because there are guys in the business that will take advantage of that and will know it Darby does not seem like the type to take advantage of it unless it's shown to him right there and then if it's shown to him then he'll take advantage of it but if he had prior knowledge to it I honestly don't think as his character he would take advantage of it it was just really odd placing, really bad, in in my opinion. Oh, and here comes the the brandy spot, and I and I'll explain why. Cody picks up Darby for a back body drop. Darby lands on his feet. Cody just walks to like the step area, and then Brandy just walks right in front of him, standing right in front of the barricade as well. Darby runs at full speed. Cody sidesteps and that's when Darby hits Brandy. It really looked and felt like, oh shit, I got a spot to do. Let me get in position. It didn't feel like a natural storytelling of, you know, let me help my husband win any way possible and let me put my life on the line for him. What should have happened was that at the same time that Darby was running, Brandy should have came in and pushed Cody so that way she could take the attack and almost be like, hey, I took this shot for you, like taking a bullet for you, you know, go beat his ass and go win because I want you to win. You're my husband, blah, blah, I'll do anything for you. That type of mindset. That's a more deeper storytelling than just getting in front of Cody Rhodes waiting for it to happen, knowing it's going to happen. And what makes it worse is that there's no crowds. The wrestlers on the ringside, as much as they are fill-ins, they're crowds. 
as much as they are fill-ins, there is no crowds. And usually that will be able, you know, you'd be able to get away with that. But because there's no crowds, you got to do certain spots smarter. You got to do them more smoother because we can see everything now. We can hear everything now. There's no sound stopping the botches. There's no sound stopping the mistakes. And I'm not saying this is a mistake. I'm just saying that this could be improved if Brandy would have pushed Cody out of the way, you know, took a bump because she knows how to take a bump. So it would have been better that way. It would have been a really better storytelling, a deeper storytelling in this. The other thing, too, is that when the collision happened, when the collision happened, Cody's reaction wasn't the best reaction there was. Darby's action wasn't the best reaction there was. You know, it was like maybe five seconds and then Cody comes in with the with the boot, doesn't really check on Brandy that much, gets back into the ring and starts this mayhem on Darby, forgetting to sell his 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 knee injury. Like story to play it up. But yet then you get so angry and to play it up. You beat up Darby for a good while. And then Darby gets to the ring ropes. Darby chop blocks Cody's knee again to try to create some distance. So that way Darby can now have um, some offense come in. Um, Darby does the code red move, which is Canadian Destroyer, and turns it into a leg lock. The leg lock uh, works on, he said that for the figure four. And the figure four is placed on after Cody Rose does a beautiful disaster kick to Darby. And then this is where Darby tries to capitalize with the figure four. That works on the knee to remind us that, you know, oh, Cody Rose's knee is hurt. You know, let's play that up in the story. When Cody gets to the ropes, there's that break. Brandy comes back out with a water bottle. Cody takes a sip, but there's an exchange. Darby grabs the water bottle, hits Cody with it, tries to do a cough and drop from there, but Cody catches him and then swings him out with the ring with the wrist control into a lariat. Both men are down. This is their resting period. After that. Um, the match will be done. No, Darby kicks out. Darby gets up the knees. Then Darby gets himself up, goes to the corner, does... Then Darby gets himself up, goes to the corner, does the coffin drop. He hits the coffin drop, but because Cody Rhodes rolls slightly to his side and does a crucifix-style pin, he gets the victory. From start to finish... There was a lot of storytelling crammed in there and there was nothing specific. It did not feel like how every other match felt where I'm like, I understand why they did this. I understand why they did that. Oh, that story like a set up for something else, you know, stuff like that. This was crammed in trying to tell a whole story within 20 minutes. The ending was horrible. Because now that Cody Rhodes decided to roll over and do a crucifix style pin for Darby's finisher that's supposed to finish the match of the coffin drop, Cody exposed how to counter it. So you're telling me that in the history of AEW, ever since Darby Allen debuted, that all it took was for one person to roll over to the side, counter it, and no one else except for the almighty Cody Rhodes figured that out. That's what I have a problem with. That's not real storytelling. That's not logical. You know, in the beginning, someone could have just stopped Darby in his tracks and, you know, broke the mystique in the early, in the early part. Fast forwarding to now, he would probably had improved the coffin drop one way or another. That would make sense. Like if someone exposes a move that you do, you should be changing up your finisher with tiny little details where people cannot break the mystique of your finisher. Your break the mystique of your finisher that was like what are you doing man what are you doing so now because the mystique of the coffin drop which no one has ever done in this business no one just flies back onto you 
Darby needs a new finisher. Now, Darby has been using that leg lock pin that we've seen him put on Sammy Guevara, which is totally fine. Like, I like that he uses that and he should use that as a last resort when you know that you as a wrestler, you know, don't have much left in the tank, don't have any much moves left, don't know what else you could do. You pull that pin out, bam, you win. What else is there? Like, the mystique of Darby Allen sort of got broken. Like, the mystique of Darby Allen sort of got broken. Got shattered. Cody did that finish that way. And the worst part is, is that Darby didn't struggle. There was no confusion. There was no backlash as to, like, motherfucker, what the fuck you mean you rolled over just to get me in a pin? Like, you know... That will throw someone for a loop because as a wrestler, you've been doing this move forever. And then all of a sudden, somebody like Cody without Arn being there at the side to yell out something like that gets gets one up on you. I I just don't. I just did not like this match. This match was too packed. The ending didn't make sense. Me personally, if Darby would have went to the finals, then so be it. But like I said, at the moment... Darby does not need the title. Cody does not need the title. And the fact that Cody won this match, I called it before in my other podcast. Once I knew that Cody was going to advance after he beat Sean Spears, that was it. They were going to set up for Cody versus Archer. And that is too soon. Too soon. I understand that sometimes you want to give the fans the hottest thing that's going on, the hottest thing that they're talking about. Sure, you should give the fans what they want. However, how is that going to be longevity? Everything that Cody Rhodes has done is not really longevity. It's more like minutes of fame. And this really like tipped it for me, which is weird tipped it for me which is weird you know for example there's a reason why i would talk forever about the young bucks matches those matches aren't 15 minutes of fame those matches have longevity those matches you could study from and be like oh be careful when the young bucks uh pulls this move out oh um the young bucks are very skilled in this kenny omega is skilled in that there's just a certain feeling I get that's different feeling I get that's different from watching the Young Bucks and Kenny versus watching Cody Rhodes. I understand that Cody is a mastermind and underlining he's a maniacal genius. I get that. You know, like I said, me saying all this is not to bash him. It's just that things could be improved and things should not feel WWE formula-esque. And this match was definitely WWE formula-esque match. It's like, you know, you were in WWE for a good amount of time. I was given his matches to analyze. Nothing you have changed. to change what's and not sometimes broken. sometimes... You have to change. Usually, what's it's not supposed broken. to be the other way around. If it's unfortunately, usually it's supposed to be the other way around. If it's not broken, but when it when it comes to the roads, you got to fix it. It's Cody the gets same the offense thing over and over Cody and over. Cody forgets to sell his knee. Darby Cody gets, gets the some offense. offense. In. Cody forgets to sell his knee. They both do each other's finishes and then they both kick out of each other's finishes and then one finisher gets ruined and now Darby Allen needs a whole new finisher that would be unique to him. The next match is Musa versus Wardlow and he went up against Wardlow. I literally put in my I literally put in my notes eh. Why is Wardlow not in some type of doesn't need to involve MJF. We understand that Wardlow was brought in as MJF's hire, his gun for hire, his bodyguard, whatever you want to call him. But because MJF is out with a nail injury, Wardlow can't get his own storyline. Wardlow can't do things for himself because, because he is an individual wrestler. Like, why does he need MJF to be there? To be, oh crap, how am I going to say this? Why does Wardlow need MJF to be there to be in any type of storyline?
and why can the same be said for Warload? Warload is having squash matches after squash matches that people don't complain about, but they'll complain about Kenny Omega having, you know, an enhance enhancement talent match. But Warlow is squashing guys left and right with no story, no nothing. And right now he's not being utilized as how he should be. He is a big guy and he's very intimidating. How come they didn't start the story off with him and Lance Archer? Lance Archer comes to AEW. Lance Archer is a big guy. He says that he's going to kill everybody. Why not take off the biggest guy in the yard? Go after Warlow. And I understand that we're probably tired of watching big guys wrestle each other. But Lance Archer will make Wardlow work for it. Lance Archer will make Wardlow be a million bucks. Put things together and see how they work. Instead of having Wardlow there in the picture. Instead of having Wardlow there in the picture. Squashing guys. Getting some offense in. Not getting offense in. And just a bunch of stuff that I, we don't need. Obviously... Warlow wins that match, but they need to book him better and not just be there waiting for the MJF return, which is next week. How cool would it be if he comes back next week and he would just praise Warlow for destroying everybody so that way eventually when it comes time for MJF to challenge for the championship or a challenge for something, no one is in his way to stop him. Kill everybody. Competition. So that way MJF could get a free pass and not worry about any distractions and go after a title. The one positive of the AEW Dynamite show is the bubbly bunch. That segment always makes me... Next we have... Jimmy Havoc, almost this killing match each other, each other. all DJ over the place killing each, each other. This no match DQ was no count out, no DQ, beating no the shit out of each other. Um, I didn't have any huge problem with um, this. Using, I using chairs because it was no DQ, no count outs. Basically, anything goes. That felt very fast paced, and it felt like, based on my notes, it was interesting that. Havoc and Kip attacked best friends first before the bell rang, but then best friends turn the tables on them and Trent goes over the top rope with a uh, tope con hilo. Um, and then the match gets underway and everyone is hitting each other with a chair. Jimmy Havoc loves to throw chairs at people, which is not supposed to be funny, but sometimes the way that it happens is funny. He knocks out Orange Cassidy for like the remainder of the match i don't know how that guy does it at all um he took he took the uh back bump on the ladder and then the back bump on the uh two chairs that was stacked up in the middle of the ring there's a renewed aggressiveness with best friends and to me that's scary but it feels right at the same time I think for the longest, best friends have been given the short end of the stick just because they're goofy and, you know, they're best friends. There was the innovative poke in the eye that happened between um, Kip, Havoc, and uh, Trent. I thought that was, like, super cool. They need to keep that as a tag team move. So in that match, best friends end up picking up the victory. Scary running power driver, even though he protected Havoc, that... Shit look that shit look devastating. The next match is Sean Spears versus Baron Black. Honestly, I want to see Sean Spears improve. I want to see Sean Spears be the best in AEW, be a main star in AEW, but right now he's none of that. And it's sad. He left WWE that didn't treat him as well. Only to come to AEW. I get stuck in the same place. I understand that on the side, you know, he has a wrestling school, but one last ride. That's all I ask. And I would definitely push Sean Spears in the past podcast episodes when they announced the TNT championship tournament. I honestly wanted Sean Spears to win. Sean Spears need that TNT championship belt because right now he's not doing anything. And the only reason why I would give it to him is because it makes sense in look wise and in story wise that he will become a champion of something. He failed to pick up the victory against Cody Rhodes when they had that feud and that feud ended way too short. I do not know why it ended short. 
And that's that 15 minutes of fame that we talk about. But then again, no one really talks about that match between Cody Rhodes and Sean Spears. I'm not even sure if they want to revisit it, but they probably should. And the best way that it could have happened is if Sean got the victory over Cody in this tournament. And that should have happened that way. It would have right all the wrongs. It's just that talented Sean Spears is. But for some reason, it just doesn't want to equate to giving him the time and the effort. AEW Dynamite, Dynamite is not that long AW of a show. AEW so Dynamite is not, not that long of a show. Spot. So not everybody can have a spot. That but that doesn't mean that Sean Spears can't do vignettes. Sean Spears can't do promos. Sean Spears can't do promos. Sean can't do promos. Sean Spears can't do and promos. just stick it in there or just upload it onto the AEW YouTube. Utilize all, social, utilize all social media platforms to get people riled up about you, you know? Like, he's one of the best. There's a reason why he was the perfect 10 in, in WWE. It worked so well. But for him to to go against Baron Black that I know nothing about. It was a very standard match. Uh, there was way too much clowning around in the match. Um, some good offense here and there, but you know, once Sean Spears hits the C4 finisher into the uh, sharpshooter, that was it. The local guys that come in, which is wrong. Sean Spears should be getting victories over top talent guys. Sean Spears is a top talent performer. Why is it not equating to his success in AEW? AEW is supposed to be different in that it gives people a spotlight. No matter where you came from, if you have talent and you're able to put out that talent, you should be able to have some type of spotlight, whether it's small, medium, or large. But why Bam, not do you yourself a people favor be talking and about make you. a video, make go a promo, on social media to search for just X the next AEW. Best hey, thing. can you upload why it onto your YouTube reminder? channel? To the fans of like, Bam, hey, remember views, me. People will be talking about you. You people know, go on you social media to work, search even for if you're not going to be best thing. Why not be the reminder to the fans of like, hey, remember me? You know, you got to put the in the work. Is, you got to put in the work, even if you're not going to be booked. The next one is Brody Lee versus Marco Stunt. I like Marco Stunt. Marco Stunt is cool. Um, no major complaints about this. It's just a regular. You could definitely see the huge size difference. Uh, sometime during the match, Marco gets in some quick offense. During the match, Marco gets in some quick offense, which I like that he does. I like that Marco tries. Marco is the epitome of... Brody grabs Marco, does this like sidewalk slam move, and then a powerbomb pin to pick up the victory. I do hope that this leads to something. I know not I know not every match needs to have a storyline that goes somewhere. Haven't shown up for any of the tapings. And all we see are vignettes of Luchasaurus trying to find his tail. This has to do something for Marco, like mentally. If not, then what's the point of putting him against big guys when he gets a little tiny offense in? Before we, I do uh, want to mention that another model. plus side is the Britt, Britt Baker, Baker vignettes. Doctor Britt of Baker, her being a role model, has been phenomenal. Britt Baker, which Britt Baker has been phenomenal with each and every segment that she does. She really does need her own reality. She's taken the heel character and she completely surprised me out of it. And it feels natural. And it feels natural. It doesn't feel like it's forced. It doesn't feel like they just told her to do it. And she's like, all right, I'll do it. It's a job. You know, it feels authentic. It feels natural. Enjoy these role model vignettes. Now we are on the main event. The winner of this match goes on to face Cody at double or nothing for the TNT championship title. What I say about the match, it will not be knocking Lance Archer. It will not be knocking Dustin. It was just the way of how the match goes that this one felt like 
it wasn't crammed in, meaning that the storytelling in this match wasn't so packed. This had a little more breathing room. However, there's a particular segment in this match that I was like, I'm done. But let me go through my notes with you guys. So at the beginning, after they tried to test each other's strengths, Dustin tries to do a power slam, but Archer pushes him off and does the pounce attack very quick early on into this match. They begin to fight. Dustin is on the outside. Archer goes and grabs a chair. He swings but misses. And then Dustin picks up that chair. And Archer does the big boot. This is spot number one. Dustin bleeds. I don't understand why every Rhodes has to have a bleeding spot. Why do we need that? It's been so overdone, even though it's been spaced out and is not done as often. But, you know, logically, if you were in a fight and someone swung a chair at you or someone big booty you with a chair or they threw you into a sharp object or just something of a corner that could split you open, it happens in real life. I get that. But why does it need to be in almost every Rhodes high profile match that doesn't need a bleeding spot? Like, I understand it's supposed to bring out more emotion, but I've seen it so many times when it comes to the roads. Sometime later during the match, because after Dustin has this bleeding spot, Archer is taking full advantage of it. Dustin gets some leeway, does a Canadian destroyer to Lance Archer. Then here comes Dustin's comeback. Some punches. He pops off a power slam. He uses the crossroads to Archer, but then Archer kicks out at one. But then again, and then Archer does a choke slam to Dustin. Dustin kicks out. Part in the match where Archer Archer walks the ropes and does a moonstalt. That is all, phenomenal. That is phenomenal. Second of all, second of all, I honestly think that's where the match should have probably stopped. I understand that when you're a wrestler and your adrenaline is kicking, you know, you get the warrior spirit and like you kick out. Like it's in you to naturally kick out because you want to, you know, show that you can fight, show that, you know, you can maybe win, but out of instinct, you kick out, right? But for someone that says that he's been studying Archer, did you study a match where he does that? No. So that should have caught you off guard. And I honestly think that that probably could have ended it. That was a very big, beautiful move. It does not happen all the time. It's not like a very common finisher. If it was a common finisher, I would have been like, no, let's keep going. But because he decided to walk the ropes, do the moonsault, his knee hit Dustin's head. If you go back and watch it, and then all of a sudden Dustin kicks out. What? <laughs> Uh, we keep going with the match. Archer tries to go for the blackout. Dustin reverses it to a big boot. But Dustin reverses it to a crucifix pin and Archer kicks out. And the expression on Archer's face is priceless and it was done right. And I love the fact that that reaction was 100% genuine. And that's what the reaction that needed to happen in that match. My problem with that, why are you going to try to do the same tactic that Cody did? Why? Why did that need to have a repeat? It felt like I was looking at the same matches except just different opponents. Meaning, instead of having Darby in both, Darby had Cody, Lance had Dustin, but the, the things that were happening in the matches were the same. There was nothing different for me to be like, oh, did you see that Dustin Rhodes and Lance Archer match? It was way different than Cody versus Darby. And you know, the reason why I'm frustrated is because I love this business too, as much as Cody does, and as much as the roads are a huge ass name. But the logic behind talking about these matches and what they're going to do, it felt like they all sat in the same room and they all talked about their matches and they all did the same thing. The only difference is that I will remember Lance Archer. The only difference is that I will remember Darby. So out of the fact that Luckily, he got out of it. Archer decides to pull the turnbuckle off. He takes Dustin's face 
and hits his face against the exposed turnbuckle a couple of times. Dustin is now on the mat. You have QT Marshall coming out with a towel. Maybe he's going to throw it in. Cody comes down, stops QT Marshall. Cody is talking to Dustin about it. Dustin grabs the towel. Lance Archer pulls Dustin into the middle of the ring. Uh, Lance grabs the towel, throws it out of the ring because he doesn't want that to happen. Takes Dustin's head, smashes it against the canvas for a little bit, and then applies the everybody dies claw attack. Both shoulders of Dustin is on the mat. Therefore, referee Aubrey counts to three. And Lance Archer picks up the victory, landing him into the final spot of Cody versus Lance at double or nothing. And that is how AEW Dynamite ends. I honestly feel like I did not get my point across about why I was so frustrated with this particular AEW Dynamite episode. And maybe in my tweet, I was a little too frustrated to think about it because Yes, Tony Khan wrote almost all the episodes of AEW Dynamite. And from start to yesterday, they were all great up until then. Felt like Cody had helped out because the underlining two biggest matches, Cody versus Darby, had underlining WWE S style formulas and and just rehashed a bunch of stuff cody booking himself strongly just doesn't sit right with me and that's what podcasts to compare the two but let's look at it but let's look at it when vince came out as his character vince mcmahon he booked himself strongly he booked himself to win the world title he booked himself to win certain matches he booked his kids to win matches he booked triple h to win matches we all know that history all right cool. is doing the you opposite and where he'll slow down he's for a little bit nope. big he gets into a program matches. with mjf so he lost against After chris jericho everything to that the he AEW agrees World to do with mjf in that program and that stipulation was that he could never challenge for the world title he again some more All right, cool. matches he you wins think here and there after he that, loses he'll slow down here and for there. a little bit nope it's not he gets into a program with mjf championship match. after everything that he agrees to do with mjf in that program he loses he has some more matches he wins here and there he loses here and there it's not until this tnt championship match that he is booking himself strong to go to double or nothing to face lance archer and i called it from a mile away that if cody rhodes did win this is what they're going to set up for and this is very predictable and that's what wwe would do wwe would definitely do a predictable thing like that i understand that lance archer is hot everybody wants lance archer cody rhodes is hot everyone talks about cody rhodes and i understand that right now the money maker is way too soon that's a wwe move lance archer comes in he's the hottest thing that that's a wwe move Lance Archer comes in. He's the hottest thing that people are talking about. You have him mow through everybody just so that he can get his hands on Cody Rhodes. How many wrestlers in AEW wants to get their hands on Cody Rhodes? How many wrestlers got their hands on Vince McMahon during, the, during that era? The booking styles are the same thing. And if All Elite Wrestling wants to make themselves known as All Elite Wrestling, I need the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega to book. Before this whole quarantine and pandemic, all the shows fall right of how Vince McMahon booked himself. Who are we still talking about? We're still talking about Cody Rhodes. MJF beat Cody Rhodes anymore. We're still talking about what Cody Rhodes is doing next. We don't talk about Sean Spears as much because Cody Rhodes beat him. We don't talk about, well, Jericho is the one exception because Jericho is Jericho. But in the essence of it, we don't say that, hey, Chris Jericho beat Cody Rhodes. We just say that Cody Rhodes can no longer challenge for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship. It's always about Cody, 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 that no matter what he does, he's booking himself strong even when he loses because we keep talking about him. And with he Darby, booked himself strong to win. He booked himself and if strong he would have to lost, win. We, and if he would have lost, we still would have been talking about it. Here we are at double or nothing. It is Cody Rhodes versus Land Charger. Who goes over and why they should go over? Lance Archer 
TNT Championship Tournament just to get at Cody Rhodes. Like, what is there to gain? If Lance Archer defeats Cody Rhodes, yeah, we'll talk about Lance Archer, but guess who we're going to be praising? We're going to be praising Cody. Does he take a back seat if he loses? Or if he wins, what is he going to do? In my mind, I don't have anything that I can tell you or speculate what should be the next thing if Cody happens to win the TNT Championship Tournament. It's not like I don't want Cody to have any championships in AEW. Hell, it's his company too. Like He should be enjoying the fruits of his labor, but to where, you know... It seems like it's, it seems like it's going to be handed to you. It seems like it's going to be a Triple H booking where, you know, you book yourself strong all the time. And then it's like, well, why should I cheer for you then? I should probably boo you or something. It just feels like it's too much. So now that Darby lost, what is Darby going to do? Who's Darby going to feud with? You know, um, where does he go from here? There's like no setups for when you lose the Gans of Rhodes. Sean Spears got lost in, in the mix. Sean Spears lost to Cody Rhodes twice and nothing. Uh, they did the search for Spears, but that had to stop due to the circumstances that we're in. But where, where's it going? It's going nowhere. Dustin lost to Lance Archer. What does Dustin do now? Kip, that he would retire. And I honestly thought that was the most stupidest marketing tactic they ever did. They really do need somebody there to tell them yes and no for their plans. And this is not a knock to anybody on, you know, AEW. And I, and this isn't me bashing. This is just me thinking out loud. And it's like, logically, it's not making sense right now. This one Dynamite show did not really make sense when all the rest of them made sense. And I could break down every single thing and tell you the stories behind the matches. I couldn't, I couldn't do this with Cody versus Darby and Lance versus Dustin. And those are my only two biggest problems with the matches on the card. Every other match was fine. I, I will accept the hardcore match as it is because that was just chaotic. And when you're fighting against Jimmy and Kip, it's probably going to be chaotic no matter what. So that's, that's totally fine. I think I have a problem with the roads always being so extra when they don't need to be extra in professional wrestling. I get it. You know, you, you want to pull on people's heartstrings and the roads are good for that because I've gotten choked up. I've gotten riled up behind whenever Cody Rose does a promo, like everything that is authentic. And that's what I love about it. But the way that he booked himself, the way that that's just how I felt about it. I want all elite wrestling to be a league of their own. And they are. We just don't need WWE style-esque and, stupid and stupid finishes. I know that AEW believes in their talent because they would not have signed the guys they have signed if it wasn't because of the talent and the storytelling that they could provide, which is completely different from anything else. The mystique of the coffin drop. Why? Why? Let's analyze that for a little bit longer with some examples. He has the big boot and then he does the leg drop as a finisher. Now, now, there are times where the opponent will know that it's coming. That's fine. They're not really exposed. That's fine. They're not really exposed. That's fine. They're not really exposed. They're not really exposed. They're not really exposed. They're Shawn Michaels does the super kick. Sometimes, you know, um, when he's waiting in the corner and he's tuning up the band and you're getting up and you're like, what the hell is that sound? Where's my opponent? Bam, he hits you with the super kick. There's probably a few times that people have sidestepped Shawn Michaels' sweet chin music, but then again, Shawn hits it out of nowhere. Bam. Um... You know, the mystique of that isn't broken. Oh, if Bret Hart puts you in the sharpshooter, we all know that sometimes planted foot and try to basically uh, take him down. But when he has you in the middle of the ring and he's sitting down on your back and you can't lift him up, his sharpshooter mystique is not broken.
the reason why I'm so against that finish is because no one does the coffin drop. No one goes up to the top of the rope with their back facing the opponent that's laying in the middle of the ring and jumps off with no fear. Darby is the first to do it. And the fact that Cody had to just slightly turn to do a crucifix pin to get the win broke the mystique of the coffin drop. That just hurt Darby. I just don't want the rest of Dynamite to be booked so heavily like that, to be booked so predictable. And I really think that they need to hire someone with a writing degree, like yours truly here, Marie Shadows, and probably say yes and no to certain ideas and try to think outside the box. Like, I wouldn't have had Lance Archer to be put in the TNT Championship Tournament only because he just got there. Yeah, it's only been a month, but let him feel with somebody else. Let's think of this scenario, which I was thinking about this for a while, right? Lance Archer comes in. He says that everybody dies and every single one of his opponents that he beats, right? They all lost. Why not? Or why can that not be a segue into those losers joining the Dark Order indirectly? Thanks to lance archer destroying them people Brody lee will have an awesome message of saying see the proof is in the numbers these are all my legions they all are losers and they're here to join the dark order you know stuff like that that may not have been like the best promo there is but just stay with me here Just because the Dark Order should probably be on top, and that would be a better direction for that. So indirectly, you have Lance Archer helping Brody Lee. And sometime along and sometime during this storyline, Brody Lee can confront. That's the end of this podcast for AEW Dynamite on April 29th. I hope you guys understood where I was coming from. I hope that you guys are not upset about my opinions, but that's just how it felt. And I'm not going to make any apologies for it. If you guys would like to talk about my opinions and state your own comments and your own thoughts, be my guest. I will definitely welcome civil conversations. If there's any name calling, that's not cool. That Don't you dare do that. Um, but you can definitely send me your response via Anchor. Anchor is a great app that allows you to leave a voice message for me to hear. And I will hear it. I will respond to you. And I will definitely play it on the next podcast episode. So if you have a thought about what I said, a comment about what I said, maybe a different perspective that I should look at it in, I welcome it. I do not deter anybody from not making comments. If you have something to say, either say it in a voice message via Anchor. The worst thing that can happen is that we agree to disagree, which is always the most civil thing to do. But that's just my perspective. That's how it felt. And I really did not like this episode because of those two matches. Everything else in between was totally fine. But I hope that next week it won't. I am Marie Shadows. Thank you for tuning into the Square Circle Podcast, and I will see you guys on the next one.